I'm going to pass control to you. And I'm going to make you a host. You're a host now. Okay. And I'm sorry on such a short notice as well. Um, you know, oh, no problem. I, this, this was such a topic uh, that people will probably get a kick out of this, you know. Um, it's an interesting topic to kick off this particular, yeah. um, you know, section. Hello. Paul, how are you, sir? Thanks for joining. Oh, hi, Paul. Hi, Shamir, with pa passing hi, Shamir. <laughs> um, I keep forgetting. Mission of Paraguay. Stephanie, is it you, Mission of Paraguay? <laughs> yeah, I keep forgetting her name. Um, so anyway, today we're starting uh, a new, uh, I guess, wave of our history. And we have like about six different things going on at the same time. And uh, today is gonna be, I guess, Q&A session on rising of Hitler. And John is going to be, uh, I guess, fielding all the questions, but it's open for everybody to answer. It's open. To, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I suspect there's a lot of knowledge here. So, so about the topic. So please share it. <laughs> yeah, please share it. You know, Paul, Mark, uh, Debbie, Stephanie. I mean, um, this is uh, open format, it, much more looser than, you know, the one we have. This is more is going to be question, you know, qu questioning and answering and giving the stories and giving your own opinion about this whole period. Uh, particularly, you know, we're also interested in, um, as you know, when we did Russia, there was so many uh, parties that were involved in, you know, in revolution. And this was a particular mini revolution, so to speak, right? So I, I'm interested in a lot of the parties that were involved, the communist party, you know, the... Uh, the SRs of uh, yeah, the, the Weimar Republic had a Weimar lot of Republic. Power, correct. Had a lot of parties. So Zach, uh -huh. are we? Do we? Did you get uh, more commitments from people to come, or is this basically it? No, there's going to be uh, 20 people. Oh, okay. The problem is Good. that I gave a password so that the control you no longer you know can't you know need to do anything. Therefore, you don't need to let people in. So if people put password, they're in, and that's it. And there's only two options now. Is it a password or a, or a waiting room? That's it. And I don't want a host sit there and look through a waiting room. That's out. And also recording is automatic. So that you don't then have to press recording either. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the video for the first 10, 15 minutes. So that this way, so all you have to do is present. Nothing else needs to be done. Uh, Good. So I Great. took, care, took Great. care of that. Um, I, I don't know why I didn't think of it before, uh, but your idea was excellent. And it's only seven o'clock, so and it's Wednesday, so people. But uh, you know, um, I'm expecting like another uh, eleven people or so, eleven, twelve okay. people. Okay. So, give it, a, we, give it a second. Yeah, we can wait a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's particularly interesting. Like I was telling to Debbie, I'm particularly also interested in his, in his death. Did he really die? I mean, obviously, you know, well. we all know he died, right? Uh, but I was reading about um, how they rounded up the assistant to a dentist, dentist assistant, to figure out his dentures and his teeth, his gold tooth, trying to figure out, and they had her draw his, you know, his teeth basically, and without telling them that, you know, that it was uh, how it looked without, you know, basically, and only like left with 15 teeth because Goering was burned, uh, was not burned as, as badly as Hitler. Because Goering killed yeah, Goebbels, Goebbels had a suicide at Nuremberg. You're thinking of Goebbels, maybe. Goebbels, oh, Goebbels, Goebbels, yeah. Goebbels, was, Goebbels, yeah. Goebbels was not burned as badly. Um, as he was recognizable. Hitler. He was recognizable, and you know, his four children was obviously, you know, uh, was. Yeah, there. they didn't burn. They didn't burn the children. Right, they didn't burn the no, children. It, I thought it was more than four, but maybe I'm wrong. it was six. I, I believe six or so. Shit, yeah. six. Yeah. Uh, their famous uh, uh, line, his wife's line, we can't live without uh, social democracy or whatever they call it. So social you couldn't live with the, She said she, that they couldn't, uh, they didn't want their children to grow up in a world without Hitler. Correct. That's right. That's right. Uh, sorry if you guys correct me. I, I, you guys are so much better at this. And that's why we just joined. Jane, uh, Michael, how are you guys? Hey there. How are you? 
Um, interesting topic today. People you are know, trickling in. Go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I'll, I'll wait till more people come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so again, for everybody today, that uh, today is going to be an open format. John is, is going to be our mediator. He's going to give about, what, 10, 15 minutes, you know, okay, kind of an yeah, overview. Yeah, walk through a few slides. A few slides, yeah. And just then, to give it, just to give it. Uh, just to put some facts on the table, topics of discussion. Um, yeah. I We're particularly we interested. All the, right. We tried to list all the questions about Hitler that, that haven't been resolved, really. Correct. Uh, particularly interested, you know, I'm particularly interested in, in the party divide and was there actually a, a democracy or was it a forced democracy from, um, you know, from other countries on Germany and it wasn't working for Germany? How was it, you know, uh, and that's because, I mean, I don't know, communists thought that, you know, bringing Hitler was somehow help him. Uh, that was so stupid. Uh, the whole thing was just ridiculous. Well, that, that was Leninist thinking. Things have to get really bad before the uh, revolution. So. Correct, uh, correct. That, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, really, it was Stalinist thinking. I think that yeah. yes. essentially <clears throat> the scene at that point, Lenin had a much better sense of international <clears throat> revolution, and yeah. he was not as, as, uh, as uh, uh, ham-handed as Stalin. Right. Right. He was also a he was also a genuine Marxist, unlike Stalin. Uh, yeah, Hitler was to a very left. Extent, yes, there's no. Uh, I mean, in principle, he was very left. In practice, he was quite flexible, though. Right. He really didn't care about economics. I mean, that that seems pretty clear. That's not no, what he that, said. That's that's quite untrue. He wrote, in <laughs> fact, he wrote an entire long book on the development of capitalism in Russia. You're talking now about Lenin. Oh, I was talking about Hitler. 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 Oh, yeah. Hitler. Yes, Hitler didn't know anything about economics. Hit, Sorry. Hit, and and that, that's my surprise also. How a man who was uh, particularly such a low rank, um, you would say, you know, soldier that, you know, had one marking, so to speak, from the World War I has risen so high. That's another question. That's an interesting. And, you know, even... You know, and then we, we're probably going to get to that, but Hinderberg was saying, I'm not going to let this low life become, you know, counselor. Uh, but, you know, and then he was supposed to, what, he was, he was, um, he was made a teacher to give him a government job so he can make him a citizen of <laughs> Germany. <laughs> it's yeah, so stupid. I'll, I'll it's, cover that. It's, it's very interesting. It's ridiculous. It's, it's, I don't understand this whole thing. Hitler was the low life bohemian corporal to, to all the aristocrats, but Ludendorff got heavily involved with him in the early days. I mean, Eric Ludendorff, the military dictator of World War I, he was the top oh, of wow. society, and he, he was arrested with Hitler at the time of, of the putsch in, in Munich when the Nazis Yeah, 1923, right, right. Ludendorff, of course, got off scot-free, but he was on trial with the Nazis. It was very, very strange, actually. That's quite interesting. I hadn't known that. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. Just odd thing about German society. I can't imagine it here, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, getting involved with radical <laughs> political power. I know, and I, I was, I, I wanted to, I actually reread it today. I was like, Ludendorff? No yeah. way. I like, <laughs> Ludendorff. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, let me just say, have you heard of James Mattis? Yes. <laughs> um, so a lot of, you know, reputable people can get involved in things that they later regret. Yeah. Yes, correct. Um, so I'm going to let... get going? Or? No, uh, it's, it's only 10 people. A couple more minutes and then... Uh, okay. And then we'll, we'll look, you know, a couple more minutes. So I'm just going to welcome new people. You know, James, he's not new. He's, we know him. Uh, and a new person, uh, Silicon Tech. Who is that? Uh, sorry, it's actually, my name's Jack Kane. Jake, I was in Jack. another meeting, so it's still saying that. Oh, man. Looks like you're in the uh, space uh, craft, uh, aircraft or something. Looks good in the back. Or that's the... Uh, yeah, it's on the Starship Enterprise. Okay, Starship <laughs> Enterprise. Uh -huh. see. That's there awesome. There you go. Thank you. That's excellent. But um, thanks for joining you know, us. No, there uh, are websites that rank 
uh, Zoom rooms or Skype rooms, you know, the quality of the background, and that's oh. a definite contender. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> definitely. I mean, is that a real room or is that background? Nah, it's, 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 a, it, it's my real room. Uh, really? yeah. <laughs> I can see I can see a little telltale pixelation behind your head. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, no, it's just it's just the background. But it looks and it looks... you too can have it by googling. Yeah, Star Trek. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right, yeah. you know what, uh, John? Now we have eleven people. Uh, please uh, go ahead. You know, and start. Okay. I got to share the screen first. Yes, yes. Please share the screen. And again, um, everybody that's new, today we're starting one of our, uh, you know, subsections of our group. Initially, this whole thing started as an ancient um, uh, historical group, <coughs> but now we're mixing it up with uh, more modern. And today we have a Q&A session and about 10 minutes of uh, presentation from John on, highs, rising on rising on Hitler, and then we will have fully heavy Q&A session on this and everybody gets to uh, participate and give their opinions and uh, listen in and learn uh, and also teach as well. <laughs> All right. Okay, can people see my screen? Yes. And then if, you might, if everybody would mute their uh, um, computers for a sec until you know, John finishes and then we'll start with the Q&A. Okay, um, I prepared a few slides, maybe too many, but as, as Zach said, this is a Q&A, a discussion session, but I thought it may make some sense to put some slides together to refresh people's memories. This is a well-known topic, but his, Hitler's early days are not so well-known. That's sort of what I focused on. He, Hitler is the most studied individual in 20th century history by historians. The only person I can think of in history who's been studied more is likely Jesus. There are over 10,000 books on every aspect of him. And the, the way I like to think of it is it's unpleasant, but who is more likely to be rem remembered in 5,000 years from the current period? It's, it's obviously going to be Hitler. He's up there with Attila the Hun and Gen Genghis Khan. Now the central question for Hitler is how so much of the German public in a democracy voted for a party in fair elections that proceeded, and that party proceeded to eliminate dem democracy once in power. It, it's a very odd event. Now, Hitler was, there's a lot of denigration of him, and there's a lot to be just disgusted by, but he was an immensely talented person. He had real charisma at the time. For example, his speaking style, and all of you have seen films of him, it looks ridiculous to us. It's so histrionic and overwrought, but it was really a great thing back then. People really liked it. Hitler, and this is the hardest thing about Hitler, he had a modernistic image. He wanted class differences abolished. He wanted individual talent to rise. He was really opposed to anything that held the German people back. He was pro-technology. He was likely the first politician in history to campaign extensive, extensively by air. I mean, he just crisscrossed Germany for tens of thousands of miles total. He really admired America's dynamism and he wanted to, for example, he wanted to build an American style skyscraper as the party headquarters in Munich. That was the center of the Nazi movement in, in the 20s. But the traditionalists around him sort of talked him out of it. It would just ruin, you know, the look of Munich. And he, on a more pessimistic note, Hitler thought America was the future. America would come to dominate all the smaller states like Germany. And Fundamentally, he was a uniquely issues-driven politician. He basically had the same ideological orientation from the beginning to the end of his career. And I'll be focusing on, on that and what developments it underwent, but, but it's really, the, the, there's still a lot of mystery about exactly what he thought. And there's been some recent new, think, new academic thinking on the topic. Um, I'll start right from the beginning. You probably, most of you have seen this picture. You can really recognize him there already. He was a very important fact about Hitler. He was born in Austria, but um, the town he was born in, Bernau am Inn, on the River Inn, was on the border with Bavaria. He was born in 1889. The, uh, that town had been part of Bava Bavaria for hundreds of years, but then it was ceded to the Habsburg monarchy monarchy in 1779, it became part of 
the Austro-Hungarian Empire in present-day Austria. Culturally, culturally, the area was still very Bavarian. And now this duality, was the Austrian, was he Bavarian and therefore German, was going to be a leading motif of Hitler's thinking for his, his entire life. It was really fundamental to him. Now Germany had become a unified country just in 1866, 32, 33 years before his birth when Bismarck uh, created it uh, under the domination of Prussia. Um, he lost both his parents at an early age. His father died when he was 14 and his mother died a few years later. His father died of a cerebral hemorrhage, his mother of cancer. There's a big mystery about Hitler's uh, paternal grandfather. We aren't sure who he was. There's been a lot of speculation about, you know, his mother may have been a housemaid in a, in a wealthy Jewish family, but that's not taken too seriously. But there are two candidates for Hitler's uh, paternal grandfather um, and it, it was a very incestuous family. They're both also relative uncles of Hitler, so there was strange things going on. But um, the name itself, Hitler, is, is Czech, I believe. Uh, there are various forms of it, Hitler, Hitler, and he settled on Hitler. At, at, before Hitler was born, his grandfather, Alois, changed, his name had been Schickelgruber. He changed it to Hitler uh, because he, this is a complex story, I should pro probably skip it, but Hit Hitler's father, uh, the father was not identified on his birth certificate, so he took the name of his wife's, who had subsequently married somebody else named Schickelgruber, but later on he changed his name to Hitler, probably because um, the real father was named Hitler, but that's not entirely sure. Hitler is reported as having been very pleased about the name change because Heil Schick Schickelgruber would have been rather ridiculous. At one point, the mother moved the family to Linz in Austria, and then she died. Her doctor was Jewish, Edward Bloch, and Hitler later, Hitler, this is evidence that Hitler, Hitler was 16 or 17 at the time. He felt quite kindly to Bloch, and later on when he was in power, he helped him to emigrate out of, from, from Austria. Now, Hitler was always a poor student. Uh, you can't even see, say mediocre. He left school for good at 16. Now, there's no information on how the loss of the two parents affected him. He, it's, it's known he was very close to his mother. Some people claim his mother was the only person he loved. Uh, here's a map of the area. Let me get my little pointer here. Whoops, skipped ahead. Too much. He was born here on the border between Upper Austria and Germany. See Munich there. Ooh, touchy, touchy keys here. You see Munich here. There's another famous location here, Hitler's later vacation home, Berchtesgaden in, in the Alps. Um, so you can see this was really Hitler's territory. He was a he was a technically Austrian, but culturally, and he thought himself very much a German. That, that was one of the strongest themes of his life, really. He was opposed to all separatist tendencies in Germany, and there were a lot of them because Germany was such, was such a recently united country, particularly in Bavaria, his chief political enemies were not the communists, they were the Bavarian separatists who wanted greater degrees of freedom from, um, from Prussia, essentially the dominant power. Okay. I just stuck this picture in here because I noticed something I hadn't noticed before. On the left, you have a class picture of Hitler. On the right, you have a class picture of Stalin at about the same age. And it's really interesting. Can, can you see the similarity between the photos? They're, they both have kind of the dominant position in, in the picture. And you can see from the cutouts here, they both have the same apparently very supercilious expression, which, uh, you know, watch out for the kids in the back row. They're, they're, they're the dangerous ones. <laughs> but I was just struck by that. Um, now, Hitler had artistic ambitions. He was always, um, he had a high opinion of his own talents. Um, so he really didn't want to go into any kind of job when he left school, but his family was well enough off. He had a small inheritance from his parents. 
So he went to Vienna, which was an artistic center of the world at the time. And uh, he tried, he applied to art school because he wanted to be a painter. And by the way, his watercolors of landscapes are pretty good. He was terrible at drawing people. But in September 1907, he failed the entrance to the uh, Art Academy. And this really drove him into a tailspin. Then his, his inheritance ran out. And he basically ended up pretty much next to homeless. They had men's homes back then, single room occupancy sorts of things. And not much, he never spoke about that period of his life. He didn't have too many friends. So not, not much is known about that period. It lasted about four years. Now, um, Vienna was very anti-Semitic at the time. It was, famous. it was a center of what the pan-German cult, which was a, a movement that wanted to unite all Germany. You know, Austria joined to Germany, which was not the case at the time, obviously. The mayor then was Karl Luger, who was a notorious anti-Semite. Hitler himself, we know he had friendly business dealings with at least two Jews, two Jews to whom he sold his paintings. He sold, was selling paintings on the street for a while. Now, in Mein Kampf, he claimed in a famous passage, you, if you've read about Hitler, you've read it, he had been horrified by the sight of an Eastern Jew in traditional clothing on the streets of Vienna. However, there's no contemporary evidence that he felt that he felt this way. And in fact, it's generally considered now that Mein Kampf, when it comes to bi biographical information, it's fiction. When he talks about politics, then it's what he really thinks. Mein Kampf has great historical value, but not for, not for the circumstances of his life. Now, there is also no contemporary evidence that Hitler was reacted negatively to the multi-ethnic character of the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was, it was called the Many People's Empire. It just had Czechs and all sorts of people, Germans. Uh, it was famous at the time. Um, he, in Vienna, he did, he was attracted to the right wing. There's evidence that he read a great many right wing pamphlets. There were lots of small groups advocating ideas that he would come to accept and develop in his own direction. For example, the swastika was already in use as a symbol of right-wing groups long before Hitler settled on it. Um, at that point, he moved, he, after the period in Vienna, he moved back to Munich and Bavaria, Munich, the capital of, of Bavaria, uh, in 1913, right before the war. He was probably, but not certainly, trying to escape the Austrian draft authorities, because he had sort of been dodging them, um, and moving to Germany was a good move. Uh, there was apparently not much cooperation. Now, the First World War hit um, in August of 1914. Uh, this is a very famous photograph, the iconic photograph taken by Heinrich Hoffmann, who was later Hitler's personal photographer. Hitler meet, met Eva Brown through Heinrich Hoffmann as Eva was working in his photographic studio at the time. The authenticity of the picture is in serious question. It's a bit too good to be true. As you can see, it shows this is the day after Germany declared war on August 1st, declared war on Russia. This is the day after uh, when the crowds are jubilant outside. This is the main square of, uh, of Munich. Hitler is of, of, of Munich, yes. Hitler was, was jubilant too, as you can see. There's a problem with the photo. It shows him with that famous shot mustache. Other photos show him with a long one. So it's thought that Hoffman may have created this, but it's, nobody has definitively proven it's a fake. There's just a lot of suspicions. The day after Hitler volunteered to enlist in the war, can everybody hear me okay? I'm getting some, I'm getting some feedback here. Is everybody Hold on, Ju uh, Judith, can you mute your line, please? Judith? Yes, I'm. Okay. Yeah, Hitler volunteered for the German army, and that was really a major statement by him. He was abandoning Austria. Uh, Austria was also in the war, but he wanted to fight with Germany. And this, as I, I mentioned, this is a fundamental part of his ideology. Hitler wanted a united Germany. No more separate principalities or separate regions like Bavaria. Um, he thought it only weakened the German nation as a whole. Um, so Hitler's war experience, he served for the duration, all four years. Uh, he was recruited into the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry Regiment. It was known as the List Regiment. And people have only studied his wartime in the, in the last few years. There was a book that came out about 10 years ago. 
about his experiences there. Uh, contrary to much later disinformation, Hitler served extremely well. He was pr promoted to a Gefreiter, that's the Lance Corporal. He was wounded twice, once in the hip, and he was blinded in an English mustard gas attack at the end of the war. He received an Iron Cross first class and an Iron Cross second class. Uh, the, the first class is rarely awarded to lower ranking personnel. His superiors thought well of him. Um, the person who had who recommended him for the for the award, his his uh, su immediate superior officer officer was a guy, a guy called Hugo Gutman, who was Jewish, but he recommended Hitler, and he survived the war. He ended up as a typewriter salesman in the in the American Midwest, but he never spoke about it, and one wonders what he what he what he thought of it. Now Hitler was always. Throughout his life, he never studied, he avoided work. Um, in later life, he, he abandoned office hours. Uh, you know, he didn't go to the office, but military life, he really seemed to suit him. He was assigned to be a regimental dispatch runner. Now, the reg regimental headquarters was behind the line, so he wasn't in the front, front lines, but his job was dangerous, as you can see by the fact he was wounded twice. He had to run around the trenches um, exposing himself. Um, now, the war's effects on his political views, he came to view England as the main enemy of Germany, mainly because he was very impressed with their fighting abilities, not so much the French. Uh, much of his later ideology had not emerged at this time, and I'll get into what that is later. Still no sign of anti-Semitism. I mentioned Hugo Gutmann. There were 60 Jews in the List Regiment, and at least one was decorated, so the overall environment was not fervently anti-Semitic. Um, and his relatively benevolent treatment of Bloch went after he became dictator and also got them, he got them both out of, out of Germany. Now, that doesn't mean that Hitler wasn't anti-Semitic. It just, it was not an obsession uh, and it didn't become a controlling feature of his personality. Um, Now, because of the armistice on November 11th, 1918, Germany was not conquered or occupied immediately, very different from World War II. And that, that was a critical factor in how badly things developed for Germany in the 20s. The German army made its way home from France. It's always unclear to me how that happened exactly because I've never seen an account of it. They kept their weapons apparently, uh, their, their small arms anyway. The British continued to maintain a blockade. This was not peace. Well, if, to, if negotiations did not go well, um, leading to the Versailles Treaty, then the war could resume at any time. Um, and in this situation, given the extreme economic conditions and the Germans had been faced with starvation, uh, the political instability just picked up enormously. There were revolutions in Berlin and Munich. Uh, these were leftist revolutions to overthrow the conservative elites and the monarchy. Hitler returned to Munich because the regiment had to be disbanded there. Uh, but Hitler did not, interestingly, Hitler did not request early demobilization, but he remained in the Reichswehr. That's what the German ar army was called then. He remained in the Reichswehr for two more years. Politically, Munich had been take, taken over by a short-lived radical left-wing council government of Kurt Eisner, who was later assassinated. He was Jewish, uh, April, but it's not known what Hitler's attitude towards him was. Um, well, it is, Hitler was very left at the time. He, he, there's no evidence, but all these left-wing Soviet council governments, he may have been quite sympathetic to them. We don't really know. It didn't last long anyway, this one. Um, Hitler's immediate post-war career, he did not show and join a Freikorps. Uh, the Freikorps were groups of par parallel military groups right wing, uh, who fought against conservatives, against the communists, and these were quite violent altercations. Uh, but then interesting things started to happen to Hitler. Go back. Yeah, the Freikorps were gangs of mostly ex-soldiers. Uh, they, they were a prominent feature of the early Weimar period. Uh, they were quite influential. They, I won't go into them in any, any detail. What's interesting is they weren't on their own. They operated closely with the official army, the Reichswehr. In fact, they, they were considered as reserve troops for the Reichswehr. It's very interesting. 
Now, he was selected by his officers, specifically Carl Mayer, who was, who was commander of his regiment, to serve in the propaganda department. Uh, this was basically to surveil the soldiers and make sure their commitment to the government and to conservatism in general. It's unclear how they found out that Hitler was suitable for this, because Hitler turned out to be a great speaker, but he had not had any opportunity to give any speeches. One of the things about his war experience, I forgot to say it, he showed absolutely no leadership ambition at all. Uh, he was offered a commission at one point, but he turned it down. It's not known why, but it's thought a lot of people didn't want to leave their acquaintances and friends. But as part of his training for this new job, Hitler was sent to an army training course, and he, he learned about these uh, subjects, the perils of Bolshevism, Ger Germany's fall from great power status, Germany's debt serfdom, because um, particularly American loans, where there was more than the reparations, uh, America was going to keep the German economy af afloat for most of the 20s, actually, but it was done by loans. Uh, attacks on finance capitalism, economic strangulation of Germany by the Western powers, the danger of Anglo-Saxon, i.e. Anglo-American world domination. Hitler developed, this was the fundamentals of Hitler's worldview. Uh, he developed over time his own mix of all these themes, but in particular, he was, he was very much a man of the left at the time. Um, and he began to give lectures on these topics to the troops, and that's probably where Hitler realized he had such a great speaking talent. And then at that point, the terms of the Versailles Treaty came out in June 1919. This was the, uh, the result of the conference of how to settle the war, the debts, the uh, political boundaries, and so forth. The terms are here. I'll, I won't read them. You can read them yourselves. They're all very familiar if you're interested in history. Um, you make a... Yeah, the German reparations, the fourth bullet, were a particularly sore point for the Germans. Uh, and, the, and the other one, the admission of guilt for the war, even though strictly not su a substantive matter, it really drove many, many Germans up the wall, including Hitler. And they limited the army to 100,000 men. They managed in the 20s to be able to get around that. And the limitation of the Navy as well. Um, and uh, Hitler's reactions, um, what happened was he was, they also, this job he had, it was also to monitor right-wing groups. And he was assigned by his superiors, another faith, faithful decision to monitor something called the Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. This was the forerunner of the NSDAP, the Nationalsozialistische uh, Deutsche Arbeiterpartei, which is the long form for Nazi. And by the way, Hitler was not the founder of this party. It was a guy named Ant Anton Drexler. Hitler, Hitler was actually member number seven. It was a very small group. Instead, when he went to monitor them, he liked what he heard so much, he became a member and he started to give public, public speeches on behalf of the party. And the frequent subjects were, well, you know what they are by now, evils of Versailles, Britain's, I should have put Britain's and America's determination to prevent Germany's emergence as a world power. America intervened in the war strictly to preserve the loans they had made to Europe uh, and the link between international capitalism and the Jew Jews. Now there's a recent study uh, by a guy named Brendan Sims, an academic that just came out last year, Hitler Global Biography. He emphasizes that Hitler became an enemy of the British and Americans before he became an enemy of the Jews. His main focus of hostility all the way through from beginning to end of his career was directed to the forces of the Anglo-American cap capitalist powers. What that means is, yes, he hated the Soviet, he hated Soviet communism and the Bolsheviks, and he hated the Jews, but they weren't the main focus. Um, that's something new. I hadn't heard that before. Now, Hitler's ideology was based on some very basic facts. Germany was in an unfortunate geographical position. It was in the middle of Europe, sort of hemmed in by other powers, uh, and it didn't, he believed it didn't have enough land, land mass to support a fl flourishing population that could compete with powers like the U.S. So this led him to the following positions. As I said, he was opposed to the capitalist world order. Jews, they were in a symbiotic relationship with Anglo-America, and they were the driving force behind international capitalism. And Bolshevism, 
was merely a capitalist tool to undermine Germany from within. So Hitler thought Lebensraum was necessary. Lebensraum means living space. He thought it was necessary to increase Germany's international power and ensure its expansion into a competitive position. He eventually settled on Russia as the target for this expansion because he, th he thought the age of empires, well, Germany got late to the game of building a, a long distance colonial empire and he thought it, it wasn't feasible. So he eventually settled on taking a chunk out of Russia as to increase German territory. There was no hint of a desire for world domination at this time. He thought Germany needed a position against the emergence of the Anglo-American power. And frankly, Hitler, in the back of his mind, was, was actually pretty pessimistic about the future of Germany. He thought they were slated to be slaves. He would make a last-ditch effort. But uh, he, he was uh, rather he was sort of interesting. When he talks about American dominance, it sounds like he was, he was looking forward to Americans' position after World War II, where America had 50% of world GDP in, in 1950. But Hitler foresaw it. John, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, this, his worldview, was it like original to him or did he co-opt, you it know? It was a mix, yeah, I didn't, there's a, a, there's a very large number of small, weird right-wing groups who, um, who came up with these ideas. They had been floating around for decades. I didn't go into the weirder aspects. There, were, there was a lot of Satanism and other, occultic thinking that went along with these views. Uh, you know, it, Himmler, what's interesting about him, Hitler, he stayed focused on the political aspect. You know, Himmler, who was one of his cronies who became head of the, the SS, um, was famous for looking into ancient German customs and folklore. Um, Hitler would have none of that. He had no use for occultism. Uh, he, he was a very practical person that way. But it really, it came out of just the right wing of Germany at the time. Uh, if... one, one, of, one of the important people in developing Hitler's ideology was an Englishman. Yes, William uh, Chamberlain, Henry uh, Stuart Houston Chamberlain. Houston Stuart Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Houston Stuart Chamberlain. He was uh, yeah, he... Neville Chamberlain's grandfather, I believe. And he yeah, was the yeah. very early uh, 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 evangelist of racial purity and anti Semitism. And I think he, I think he repatriated and, and became a German citizen. Yeah. Well, Hitler, the other aspect of Hitler is his racial views. They're, they're infamous, of course, but according to Sims, uh, they, they've been somewhat misinterpreted. I, I found this particularly interesting. He saw the elimination of Jews, Roma, gypsies, and other groups as necessary. What, what elimination meant in the early 20s was not specified. And he ranked various groups in a hierarchy of hierarchy of purity, the Nordics were on top, the, the, um, um, the um, Anglo-Saxon were in the middle and, and the Slavs were on the bottom. Uh, and he did, what's little understood is that Hitler had a low opinion of German racial purity. And this is expressed repeatedly in Mein Kampf. He believed the Germans were a mongrel race as there had been too much fragmentation and intrusion of non-Germanic peoples into Germany's racial stock over the centuries. He believed the English in particular were of a higher purity and were superior to the Germans. Hitler also assigned a higher high purity rating to the Americans, primarily because so many Germans had emigrated to the US and Hitler was convinced it was the best people who emigrated. They had the most energy and the most talent. And I, I looked up the figure, I think there were 6 million, 6.2 million Germans em, em, emigrated to the U.S. between 1830 and 1910. I forget the dates exactly, but it was substantial and they proceeded to propagate and become a very large ethnic group in the U.S. So Hitler was of the opinion, not only did you have to get rid of the bad elements, you also had to regenerate the German people themselves. Uh, and this wasn't just eugenics, it was affecting them entire lifestyle. He wanted people to be more, it's odd for Hitler to talk about this, he wanted people to be more physically fit and, and athletic. And that became very much a part of, um, of Nazi society. Um, now, what's interesting, I had always thought personally that Hitler was profoundly ignorant of the US. He wasn't. His writing in Mein Kampf and his conversations with other people exhibit detailed knowledge of, of the US, conditions in the US, 
Uh, he was a great reader. That's known. That, that's his one talent. He, he had a personal library of 16,000 books, which, you know, when he died was, was captured. Not too much of it has survived. But uh, he, he mostly read history and politics, and he knew a great deal. Uh, and uh, he had non-mainstream views, but he read some of the best history. Uh, now, a little bit of background on the Weimar Republic. Most of you are governed from 1919 to 1933. It was essentially founded by the SPD, the Social Party. Another, another thing, we think of Wilhelm I, Wilhelm I Ger Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm II as a place where you had those Pickle Harbor military uh, helmets and, uh, and um, everybody was deeply conservative uh, and hierarchical. But in fact, uh, the Social Democratic Party of Germany was the largest party in Germany throughout this period, uh, even before the war. And that, that was another tragic uh, factor in what happened to Germany. The SPD voted for the war credits to fund World War I. Um, but the um, Weimar Republic, when, when Wilhelm abdicated, as he did, uh, the monarchy was gone. So they founded a republic that was founded by the SPD. And unfortunately, there was a great deal of political unrest. There were multiple German revolutions, really, in various locales. And this unrest went on from November 1918 to August 1919. This was against the background of horrible living conditions. And the Germans blamed the monarchy and the conservative el elites who had run the war. Leftist revolutionary, revolutionaries were very active. They founded several local governments, of which Munich was one, as I pointed out. What's funny about this historically is the right, the conservative, conservative elites, the Hindenburgs, the Ludendorffs, Wilhelm, they escaped all the blame for the war when they got off the stage and they got all the blame for the economic mi misery, but the Republic got blamed for everything. Who had it. So the Republic became the number one target of the right and the Republic also mostly met the terms of the Versailles Treaty, particularly the rep reparations. They made serious efforts with a few lapses uh, to meet them. And unfortunately, Jewish politic politicians were associated with, with the Republic in the public mind, uh, very much so. A figure like Walter Ratzner, um, who was assassinated in 1923 by ex Freikorps people. Um, but you can see this on the holy mix of, of, of bad tendencies coming together in Weimar. Now, I'm going to go quickly through the 20s, so I don't take up too much time. At first, Hitler thought they could take control of the government of Berlin uh, through violent action. And the word for coup was putsch. Um, you know, in the early 20s, Germany was facing foreign occupation. The French had, you know, when, when the Republic missed a, a reparations payment, the French marched into, into the Rhineland. Um, they, they had internal separatist forces. Bavaria wanted to secede. Um, Hitler wanted to keep them together. There were multiple leftist re revolutions. When the Stresemann government failed to end the French occupation of the Rhineland, this was in 1923, this really brought the whole situation to a boil. And conservatives, both conservatives, the Ludendorffs of the world and the NSDAP, the Nazis, saw, saw a coup against the Weimar Republic as the only solution. And the NSDAP, Hitler, wanted to trigger it by marching in Munich to the main square, the Odeonsplatz, um, and uh, they were hoping there would be a national uprising. Unfortunately for them, they encountered police forces who started shooting. Uh, there were several deaths. Hitler fled. He was arrested a few days later, tried and sentenced in March 24 to five years in prison, imprisonment. As I said, Ludendorff was also tried now, and he was acquitted because of his status. Uh, the trial f was very good for Hitler, though, because he was such a good speaker that he got all the attention. This was effectively the end of Ludendorff's career. He didn't figure in German politics after this. And he served, Hitler served the sentence in very comfortable circumstances and was released after nine months, I believe, and he wrote Mein Kampf during it. Um, and that's one thing, that's a mystery about German society, why Ludendorff would associate himself with such apparently inconsequential inconse people, because Hitler was a well-known figure around Munich at the time, but he was a nobody in Germany on the whole. Um, but why, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine a greater social distance uh, than that, but it, it's, it's a mystery. Um, now, this is a chart 
uh, after the putsch, Hitler became convinced that violence wasn't the answer, and he stuck to that, um, stuck to that policy all the way up to 1933. He decided to take an electoral approach to gaining power, and so he started running for office um, and posting candidates for the Reichstag, that, that's the German parliament. And the rest of the 20s sort of show the Nazis making progress with the voters. You can read the numbers yourself. Uh, one of the issues with Weimar, the Weimar Republic, it had a, uh, there were very low barriers to getting members in uh, the Reichstag. So there was a plethora of little parties and they all got seats. So uh, 6.5 and 24, it dropped for some reason to three in 1924. It reached rock bottom in May 28, it was 2.6. Uh, that put them in ninth place, uh, of, uh, right at the bottom, towards the bottom. September 1930, this was a breakthrough. And you notice a pattern when um, the Great Depression, when the Wall Street crash occurred in October 1929, that's when uh, Hitlerism, uh, Nazism, Nazism began to do well. and. Uh, from 1930 to 1932, their support doubled and they were first place. Remember there are so many parties around that are splitting the vote, 37.4% is an excellent result in, in the Weimar Republic. And they, November 1932, they dropped a little bit, but it's probably just a blip. Uh, Hitler also ran against uh, Hindenburg directly and he did respectably that that was a, that I didn't list, there was a communist candidate in both who got around 10, 10% and there was another candidate who I forget who got around 10%. So these are pretty good results for Hitler, uh, but not enough. Um, now to give you the general part of the 20s, well, basically it was a hellhole. The hyperinflation, they were printing money to pay the reparations and finance the government. It wiped out the savings of millions and produced a terrorized, uh, really angry population. Uh, which will play out in the next 20 years. Reparations payments were a hated burden. Uh, American banks were happy to make loans to Germany. And basically, um, things got better from 1924 to 1928. These were called the golden years of the Weimar Republic, but it was financed by American loans. And when Wall Street crashed, the loans went away. So economic conditions in Germany quickly deteriorated. GDP in Germany shrank by 24% from 1929 to 1932. That's when the Nazis had their big breakthrough, as I mentioned. Uh, Hitler, all the way through this period, Hitler did not modify his positions much. He kept, he, he wasn't a specific issues guy. He wouldn't get down and argue about tax rates. He, he thought of true leader, just did the deep thinking and came up with the major directions. But he, through his, his speeching, he did not, he kept the same positions all the way through and all, all of a sudden people started responding to him. He also worked hard to appear respectable. You know, the essay, the storm up Tylung, that was Hitler's paramilitary. Uh, you know, their main job was, brawl, you know, street brawling with the communists. But he tried to tamp that down because he really did want to get middle classes on his side. And then Hitler becomes chancellor. Oh, but not. Hitler becomes, how did Hitler become chancellor? Well, Hindenburg, the World War I hero, as president appointed the chancellor. It was, a, it was like um, Germany today, a ceremonial president, but the chancellor actually is the political power and does all the work. The last three chancellors of the Weimar Republic, Brüning, Papen, and Schleicher, they all, they had to resign due to the economic conditions, which is politically too difficult for them. And Hitler possessing the most seats in the Reichstag at the time, had a good claim to be selected chancellor. Hindenburg refused to accept him. Uh, it's not just social snobbery. He thought Hitler was totally unsuited. Um, he treated opponents very roughly, I think Hindenburg uh, said about him at one point. Hitler just held tough. They offered him the uh, vice chancellor position. He refused to take it. It was all or nothing. Eventually, Papen, von Papen, who was an aristocrat, he got it into his head that he could, it would be possible for him to make a deal with Hitler and stock the cabinet, they had cabinets, with all traditional elite conservatives. And if you look at the early Hitler cabinet, it's filled with people who had nothing to do with Hitler, but they were there hoping to keep him in, in his place and that didn't work out. 
the, the old leftist charge that Hitler was just a creation and a tool of big business is not true. There's no evidence that they were, they were all scared of Hitler and they very few wanted to have anything to do with him. So Hitler was eventually, I won't go into the political machinations involved because there was a lot of twists and turns and how he got the power, but he was appointed in January, 1933 uh, as chancellor. And that's why, basically that's when my period ends, period of this talk. I, it wasn't a dictatorship at the, this point. They had to pass something called the Enabling Act a few months later that it basically made it into a one party uh, dictatorship. But this is when Hitler made it. Um, Oops, why do that? This go away. So this is my last slide. Who voted for Hitler? That's still an uns you know an unsolved question. Um, it's, this is most studied voter behavior in history. Uh, there's one opinion comes from a well-known person, Seymour Martin Lipset, typical hit Hitler supporter, was middle-class self-employed Protestant who lived on a farm or in a small community. Um, there was another guy, Richard F. Hamilton. These are all uh, opinions from the last few decades. He believed the opposite. It was the upper classes, white collar, self-employed, were a bedrock of Nazi support. Generally, a common opinion, it was the lower middle class who were Hitler supporters. Now, there was a recent statistical analysis um, that basically it was a group called the working poor, but these it was the working poor. These were employed people who were certain of continued employment. They were independent artisans, shopkeepers, small farmers. Why lawyers are in there, I don't know. I don't think of them as the working poor, but maybe they were in Germany. The domestic workers were an important group and family members of the work. People who could count on, maybe they wouldn't make much money, but they would keep their job. On the other hand, there were the unemployed. They went communist. The working poor, went Nazi. Um, and another factor was support was higher in Protestant areas than in Catholic regions. Northern Germany is mainly Protestant. Southern Germany, including Bavaria, is main, mainly Catholic, I think. Um, the Catholic Church had strong political links with the main Catholic party in the South, in the South, the Central Party. They conducted a lot of charitable work, so uh, they were able they were able to keep Catholic voters not going over to the Nazis. And it's, it's a bit unclear why they succeeded, but they did. But anyway, that's, that's the end of my slide, so have at it. All right, we're gonna open up for questions and um, any kind of additions you wanna give. Paul, Mike, anybody? Go ahead. I'd just like to ask one question. Uh, how much of a part did the street fighting that uh, accompanied uh, Munich and uh, later periods, how much did that play in Hitler's rise? It's hard to say, uh, because he did. After, before, before the putsch in 1923, he was intent on a revolutionary violent strategy. Afterwards, he, he eschewed all of that. Um, so there, there were brawls going on, but Hitler was firmly focused on turning himself not a mainstream politician, but an electable politician, electable by the majority. So the, um, he was, as the 20s went on, he got more worried about the, because they were a radical group. Um, and eventually, as it's famous from the Night of the Long Knives, he eliminated the SA. Uh, they became too much trouble. Say, so how much did it? They were the base. They were the most fervent. Um, so they certainly played a part. But Hitler's overall strategy was in another another direction, winning elections. So it's 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 hard to say. Does anybody else have any ideas? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 go I ahead. have like a, a very different take on this whole period. Uh, in okay. my mind, it's that that uh, the key to uh, understand uh, part of the key to understanding Hitler is to really understand what happened with the with the German communist and socialist parties that they basically had the first shot at it. Um, they could, Jane, when talk about street fighting, well, who were they street fighting? Yeah, the, the they were the so the the. The, the way that I've always understood this is that 
the, the, the really the, the crucial elements that forced the Germans to seek the end of World War I were the mutinies among its troops at the Kiel dockyards Correct. and among the workers and related to the fact that the Bolsheviks had had so much success uh, agitating among their soldiers. And everybody was watching the Bolsheviks. In fact, Hitler was watching the Bolsheviks, and I think that comes out really clearly in Mein Kampf. Hitler expresses admiration in the way that the, um, the tactical way that the communists were able to break the law in street demonstrations. And he basically said, well, I can do that too. And I think as a famous thought attributed to him, a quote attributed to him, is basically saying, give me fanatics. I don't need the people, I need fanatics, which in a certain sense is a, a kind of a bastardized way of looking at what Lenin's philosophy was in what is to be done, that, that what you need are dedicated professional revolutionaries is the way that, that, that Lenin put it. But the idea that a very, very small group of people who are completely committed, willing to sacrifice their lives, willing to sacrifice everything, um, was, was the key to, to um, what Lenin saw and what, what Hitler then took from that. That's, that's true. Early Hitler had tried to outline a change in his thinking as a result of the push that he switched strategy. At, at the beginning, he was interested in a violent revolution. That's what they were aiming for, but he realized it was not practical. I mean, well, Lenin, the had, Bolshevik revolution was really a, a coup by a small group staged in, in uh, St. Petersburg. It, and it was restricted to one city. I don't know whether that even that's really the whole true, country. I mean, what? I don't know whether that's really true. I mean, I, the sense that I get from, from what I read is that, that, you know, I'm not saying that they were, that they had a majority or anything like that, but I think they had a widespread organization throughout all the major cities in, uh, in Russia. And that even more importantly, that they had key cadre in the leadership of the, of the trade unions. And they were able to exercise tremendous control of things like the trains. Hmm. Uh, uh, so for example, during, during the time when when there was a, an attempt to send soldiers to put down uh, before, after the February revolution, but before the October revolution, was it Kornilov? Yes. Uh, uh, was coming to Moscow. And uh, my understanding was that the, the, uh, the Bolsheviks were able to get their uh, contacts in the railroad workers to reroute the trains. Mm -hmm. So they didn't get to Leningrad. And I think that, that this type of, of networking was something that that the had been built up by both the Bolsheviks and the Mensheviks over many years of organizing with the intention that this is how you make a revolution. I, I, I take your points. Uh, I, I was channeling Richard Pipes, who's written, who wrote several books on the Soviet Union. He, he described the the um, October the October Revolution as a big city coup. Yeah, Richard Pikes, if I may add, is uh, hardly a reference. I mean, he's he's a historian with long uh, yeah. ties, I believe, to the CIA, so he's hardly an impartial uh, and source. And there are very few Paul, Paul is very correct about what he's saying with the one uh, slight correction, Paul. I believe the railroad workers in uh, were actually led by the social revolutionaries. They certainly mm -hmm. did. Uh, collaborate with the uh, uh, the Bolsheviks in defense of the revolution against transporting Kornilov's troops. Hmm. And that's you know, I, and I that's that's a good correction. Um, I want to. So, so what I'm saying is that when you think that all through, that this was the great fear among the <clears throat> German upper class that 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 what happened in Russia was going to happen again in Germany, and. Uh, there were so many examples of it popping up all over the place. I think that the, my sense is that the, the, the industrialists had accepted Hitler because they felt that, that Hitler and the brown shirts 
were the only force that was capable of meeting the communists and the socialists but in the street. Hitler, Hitler was the party, the Nazi party was cash poor right up until Hitler becoming chancellor. Big, the, the in big industrialists, and, and this is what would prove your position, the big industrialists were not funding him. Um, that may or may not. There's lots of evidence they were highly suspicious of him. Um, that, that, that could be true, Hitler was, but it doesn't change the fact, John, that while Hitler may have had an electoral strategy, you'll remember some years back, so did David Duke, um, the clan, former clan leader. Um, what he was actually doing was building something approaching the Freikorps, a, an extra legal private army. Absolutely. And oh, like that the Proud was, Boys. But exactly. He, he, one second, let uh, Jack. You had something to say. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, like the Proud Boys. Precisely. <laughs> much, much, Precisely. much, much more, uh, uh, much more than the Proud Boys. Can I, I the Proud Boys? Can I, like, uh, like a fraternity party? <laughs> can I? Yeah. Be, the Fry Corps were people that were fully armed. They had armed vehicles. They lived in military barracks. They didn't, were not integrated into society. They fought under a banner, which was essentially uh, the, uh, what was the, the pirate, the, the skull and crossbones and mm -hmm. early adopters of the swastika. So uh, yeah. No, yeah, they, yeah, these were very, and they, they, among other things, they murdered Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Mm -hmm. And yes. This changed history in my in my view. Because this murdered a uh, chance for the Russian I, for the German Revolution to succeed. It ended with the death of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Yep. Yep. Hmm. And there was was actually, a, oh, go ahead. There was actually a discussion uh, in the uh, Russian Soviet uh, Communist Party Politburo about, uh, and one proposal was to send Trotsky to Germany. Uh, to aid the revolution for what various reasons it didn't happen. Uh, but that was seriously discussed. Tell, um, tell, tell was Trotsky's him. position. Trotsky's position was that, the, that, that Russia, that the Soviet Union could not survive as an isolated Soviet Union. You couldn't make socialism in one country. That for, yes. the, for the revolution to survive, it had to spread and become an international revolution. And he, he put all his chips on that. Stalin, his slogan was, was socialism in one country. So the idea that, so a lot of what happened in the way that the Soviet Union dealt with the communist parties outside of Russia had to do with factional politics between Stalin and his left resistance, where he wanted to crush them. Wait, can I, can I interject? In a, period, in a period by, if I may add. One second. Uh, uh, Go ahead, uh, uh, Hadrian, and then Mike after, after Hadrian. Hadrian, you first, and then Mike, go ahead. Yeah, 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 so I just wanted to say, if you look at the history of the Russian Revolution, there's a point where, um, uh, where you still have the civil war going on, and uh, Stalin uh, is enticed by the idea of starting a communist revolution in uh, Poland, and so he tries to invade. Uh, but what happens, it's actually kind of incredible because the... So the Polish nationalists were uh, much stronger than what uh, Stalin expected, and they were able to repel the uh, communist army. Uh, but also the, the uh, communist army was extremely uh, under equipped. Like uh, they basically, they didn't have uh, boots, uh, they didn't have anything. And um, Stalin being so ideologically blinded that he was actually believed that, um, like he couldn't even conceptualize nationalism. Uh, he thought that the poor uh, peasants of uh, Poland would uh, welcome the uh, army with open arms. And when he realized that wasn't the case, uh, he basically, that's when he decided that uh, he should probably uh, stop uh, invading other countries. And also at one point, uh, as you say, there was like this talk of uh, uh, smuggling weapons and giving money to the uh, German communists. And then there was actually a coup in Germany that failed for the communists. Yeah. And that's when uh, they decided not to do it. But Basically, at that point, uh, Stalin had already failed uh, twice in his mind to uh, start a communist revolution in Europe. And then, uh, yeah, he didn't really try again. And also, 
Trotsky, uh, he had a lot of international support, but actually at home, Trotsky was, was much, much weaker than Stalin. So yeah. he couldn't really uh, yeah, change the course of history in that way. So. Mike, you're next. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm going to abandon that whole part of it uh, because I wanted to comment on something else, which is this interesting slide that John has still up happily. Interesting. I like that. Uh, you, you have something uh, up, John? I don't see it. <laughs> which slide is? You can't no, no, no. See the it? very, the very last one about who voted for Hitler. Yes, thank you. Uh, and to point out that from a the point of view of of class analysis. All yeah. of the, almost all of these different groups that are being mentioned, whether they're farmers or white collar uh, workers or self, particularly anyone who's self-employed um, uh, and including so-called independent artisans or shopkeepers, uh, even lawyers, uh, their families are all what Marxists would call part of the petty bourgeoisie. Yeah, it was a very, true. very large, very diverse uh, class. Um, and this was um, the working poor is a very poor term for that because lots of people, every, most people work, but that doesn't mean that they're all in the same, that they're all part of the working class. The petty right. bourgeoisie is a different class. Um, and um, uh, and the point about the Catholics in the South is, is quite reasonable. Uh, but this, uh, you know, in the, in the, with the failure of the German Revolution in the early 20s, with the economic crisis uh, at the end and the, and the onset of the Great Depression uh, at the end of the decade, uh, Hitler's program was appealing precisely because the ruling class in Germany was no longer able to keep order, was no longer able to rule in, uh, under those conditions in the normal way. And into that vacuum stepped Hitler with his private army uh, and his weird ideas, which sounded plausible. Um, no, to a lot of, particularly a lot of the petty bourgeoisie, who, as Trotsky wrote, uh, were, the, were, he called it the frenzied petty bourgeoisie, that was, whose greatest fear was that they could end up in the working class, yeah, uh, or of I course, agree. worse, I unemployed. Mean, you dismiss my, my authority, Richard Pipes, but I, I wouldn't take Trotsky seriously as a political thinker. That's kind of ridiculous at this point. Well, stage. I do, so I don't think it's ridiculous at all, John. Uh, and I think uh, that's the point Paul is making, that this is the analysis put forward by Marxist thinkers are very easily, very commonly, and all too erroneously dismissed. Yeah, and it's, I, I wouldn't agree that there was a vacuum. To the extent that it seemed like a vacuum, it was, it was precisely because, the, the, um, because of the, the failure of the Communist Party to adopt now, look, I, I'm, I don't think, I'm not a Trotsky lover, and I don't think that Trotsky could have saved the world or, or, or led the revolution, but he did have a lot of really good theoretical analytical thoughts. And Trotsky proposed a united front between the, social, between the, uh, the socialists and the communists, and the failure to do that is what made it seem like there was a vacuum. But there, had that been had that happened, and it could have happened had that been supported by Moscow, because the the Communist Party at that point in time were basically puppets of the orders that they were getting from Comintern. And well, I think you're talking about the '30s, no? Well, the early '30s. Was the Comintern, Comintern, was the yes, 30s. But, but the but the basic thrust of it. Okay. Which is quite different from the twenties. You're quite right. Uh, in 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 the uh, fight leading up to uh, uh, once uh, Hitler had been appointed chancellor, uh, Trotsky was calling for united fronts, uh, not a merger, uh, not a political alliance, but a un united front uh, between socialist and communist workers uh, to unite the class and to smash the fascists. 
and he realized that 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 he realized that right. there was and no was, going was, back if Hitler got in. Yes, and it was the Stalinist leaderships that refused to do that. That's quite true. And, this, uh, and the, true. the 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 uh, justification that they gave was that that they will actually that if if Hitler is elected, it will increase the militancy of German workers, and in the long term, that will benefit the Communist Party. Which goes to show the political, um, shall we say, acumen of Stalinism. The, to the total bank, or it was just a, a uh, you know, a, uh, a, a rationalization for right. a policy made along entirely well, pragmatic well, and, and, and other reasons. Not, and and, well, and well, fundamentally yeah. non-revolutionary. Well, well uh, guys, 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 yes. we're going to come back to Hitler. <laughs> Russian uh, Revolution, for yeah. I, want, no, I, I, I was I, just going to say Hitler came to power by yeah. legal means. Uh, he certainly had a private army, which he proceeded to get rid of after he took power. They, they were a threat to him. Right. He well, by then he had, he had the German army. He had oh, the SS. They were a threat to the army more than they were. Yeah, to uh, him. but um, it, it, it was not a revolutionary coup uh, the way Hitler came to power. He had failed in that. So yes, I but John, to, consider to... consider this, if I may offer something. I don't think I don't believe uh, um, our current president is often called a fascist. I don't believe that's true. Um, at least, you, you know, I can't say I can't speak to what's inside his head. But the point is that he came to power as president through the normal channels of yeah. what I would call bourgeois democracy. Yeah. Uh, that is not precisely how Hitler came to power. Hitler came to power, if it had not been for the Nazi party and the SA, Hitler would not have had any power. His ideas may have, might have gone somewhere, but they probably wouldn't have accrued to him. The fact that he had an, an electoral strategy doesn't mean that he came to power through democratic means beating people up in the streets and instilling terror in the population that disagrees with you and opposes you is not part normally of bourgeois democracy. That's not the political norm. But that was We also, don't see that happening yet today. That was also communist that was also communist behavior. Yeah, to do what? <clears throat> to, you you speak in such to fight the Nazis terrified yes, tones of Nazi violence, but you say nothing about communist violence. The communists didn't go around beating up innocent people. The only people they fought with they, were the Nazis. They wanted to And, and they didn't do a very good job of it either. And it wasn't, and it wasn't unilateral. I mean, the, look, uh, the, 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 the leaders of the, of, the, of the Communist Party offered to debate the leaders of the Nazi Party, Wait, which is something know, that, which is something you don't good. usually do to your enemy. Well, Wait, hold on. Didn't no, communists no, no, no. didn't communists you know, take you know over what happened in 1917? What happened? Well, basically, uh, they had uh, cells of uh, the Communist Party that just popped up randomly everywhere in Russia, where uh, the whites were not present. And basically, a local cell would be just a group of thugs that called themselves the local cell. And what they would do was uh, they would go to the rich people's house and they would uh, rape their daughters, uh, steal their property. And torture them. And uh, that's a lie. Story. No, that's true. That there is simply stories. a lie. So there's the peasants. The peasants yeah. were in revolt throughout much of Russia. That is quite true. They burned down manors and they yeah. seized the land. And the Bolsheviks supported okay, listen, them. Listen, I read this. I read this in the biography of uh, Stalin, uh, written by Stephen Kotkin. And so he cites uh, letters. I'm sorry, and, written by who? Stephen Kotkin. He's like an expert on on. Uh, so, 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 it's the latest big biography of Stalin. It's in three volumes, two yeah, have come the, out. It's uh -huh. like a award-winning biography. It's also uh, very long and very detailed. And it really explains everything that happened, like every single day. And uh, uh, one thing he, he gives, an example he gives, was uh, uh, not too far from Moscow, there was uh, like a cell of communists that took over a small uh, village. And what they did was they put uh, all the rich people, like. Uh, Everyone they could find, they just put them on a boat in the middle of the freezing um, lake um, of the freezing river, and they would have them like work, uh, you know, like 12 hour shifts in uh, slavery, basically. And then at one point, uh, they started collapsing from fatigue and uh, undernourishment. And so they brought a doctor on board, and the doctor told them that 
you know, the slaves were being malnourished, like uh, they couldn't uh, continue any longer. And so what they did was they, uh, they decided that uh, the doctor was actually part of the bourgeois class. And so they kept him on the boat as a, as a prisoner. And that, I mean, that was going on basically everywhere. Like the, the early cells of the communists, they would, like, you, you could literally <laughs> just go in a village and you would see a guy like, going around in fur coats and, uh, you know, his hands like full of diamonds. And that would be, uh, you know, the local party boss. And there was basically no accountability. Like you, you could literally just kill someone. I have no happen. doubt. I and have no doubt. Such that chaos there were was also happening that there, even before no the wait, 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 uh, wait, guys. On Hitler. Hold on, um, James. I have a point. Go ahead, James. Yeah, I just want to ask a, a, a question. Uh, could we back, map back through the presentation so far and track the growth of the anti-Semitism there? I, I, like, I, I like that a lot. And I also want, want uh, to raise one question on Hitler manipulation. Why did people always never gave him a credit and he always ended up emerging on top? That's the biggest question that I have. Like Poppin thought that he's going to make him wi wi you know, vice counselor and stuff like that. And he said, he's just going to be my puppet. I'm going to be second. He's going to be second in command. I'm going to be the one ruling him. And... Um, so go ahead, John. Go ahead. I apologize. Oh, no, no. I, I, was, I was just asking you to clarify your question, but then I realized I understood it. Um, Pap Pap Papin's motivations are always presented that way. I don't know if he wrote a memoir. I don't believe he did uh, as to uh, what his motives were, but it was one of the great political, the greatest political blunder in, in modern history, at least. So. Basically a Frankenstein story. It may have been the arrogant aristocrat thought he could control the bohemian bohemian it's a Frankenstein culture. story where the monster yeah. uh, can't be controlled and starts walking off on his own. Yeah. And, and the and the, the mad doctor stands there saying, What did I do wrong? as he becomes irrelevant. Right. I thought that von Papen became the sort of forgiven or, or whatever you would call it, redeemed his reputation because it, he gave the speech to the Reichstag that Hitler then tried to suppress. So at the end of his life, he was, Didn't he was viewed as a, German a positive. Ambassador to Turkey during the, during the war years? I'm sorry, what was the question? Didn't von Papen become the German ambassador to Turkey during the early war years? I don't, I don't remember. I got to No, I thought he was assassinated by Hitler's people eventually. But the the the, the thing that I, I I do remember that von Papen gave that speech at the Reichstag and it was Hitler was furious and he suppressed it. And then um but anyway, but it, it, my other question was more more about the the this Hitler's background. I mean, it's, it's, I know for a fact, at least for my family, that uh, people in the 1920s who were Jews in Poland, actually a lot of them wanted to emigrate to Germany. And it mm. wasn't very, it, it wasn't very visible then. When was the this exactly? Sorry? When was this? In, I I can't know I, I, I can't know exactly what dates, but people were still Jews were still from rural areas, and, uh, and, and wanted to move to Germany. After after Hitler's accession to power? Uh, no, I don't know the what, the exact dates. By the but way, my broader question is if yeah, yeah, can, can we map the the growth of anti-Semitism in Germany? to whatever uh, the same time frames we'd be discussing this presentation here. I just quickly, went quickly, I just looked it up and von Papen was the ambassador of Germany to Vienna 1934 to 1938 hmm. and to Ankara from 1939 to 1944. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. That's why, that's why Turkey never uh, became, uh, never, never entered the war or entered as fictitiously at the end. Well, it's not why. Just uh, had an ambassador there. Oh well, no! Yeah, the, the whole the whole paradigm not them and not entering the war. We got to address that at some some point. But anyway, John, can you address that question or anybody uh, on the growth of anti-Semitism? 
I, nobody did the public opinion polling at the time, so it's difficult to know. Uh, mm -hmm. condition, oh, Germany nobody. was not a particularly anti-Semitic country. That's one of the great paradoxes. Yeah. Of, you know, back then, everybody hated the Jews. I mean, that, that's the reality. Anti-Semitism was, by, it's all impressionistic. There are no statistics, but every, it, all, Poland was fiercely anti-Semitic. Russia was fiercely anti-Semitic. Germany was actually relatively enlightened. Well, yeah. I, I could Jews comment were on predominantly it. upper middle class. That, that, class that, that was my impression that, that in the shtetls, that, that in pre-war years, uh, Germany was viewed as by Jews as being somewhat um, enlightened. But there was only 200,000, 200, 200 to 300,000 Five, Jews living. 500,000. 500,000, sorry. Richard at, told at us, I checked it. Yeah. So and, it was uh, a very small group and a very elite group. There was, I don't think there were any Jewish workers in German factories, which, you know, would have attracted Poles. Uh, I've never heard about that. Uh, yeah, if, the, I could comment, if I could comment on that, there was, ahead, there was an interesting book written some years ago, uh, an Austrian named George Klar, or Georg Klar, George Clare, mm -hmm. who fled Austria in around 37 or 38, went to Germany, where he thought things might be better, and then made it to, to England and wrote a book on that. I think one of his comments that I, th I think is illuminating as a schematic comment, he says, the Austrians are really strong anti-Semites, but very mediocre Nazis. The Germans are, fab are terrific Nazis and very mediocre anti-Semites. Mm. He was in Berlin uh, in 38 in Kristallnacht. And hmm. his account of it was these were the Nazi thugs that were doing anything. And most of the German people, at least all the ones he ran into, were totally appalled by it. So this was, um, furthermore, of course, we know that Hitler um, came from uh, Vienna. Uh, and there was a, um, a mayor of Vienna. Right. Um, what was his name? Karl Luger. Hmm? Karl Luger. Karl Luger yeah, I mentioned who was, him. Who was a vicious anti-Semite and built a lot of his political power on anti-Semitism. And that's where Hitler learned the populist, poli the potential populist politics, if you will, of anti-Semitism, which he then took to Germany with him. Um, so in that sense, anti-Semitism, uh, according to this interpretation, was really a top-down thing. And of course, the, um, the Holocaust was done more or less secretly. It wasn't published. It was a most, I guess, the death camps were mostly outside of Germany. So this wasn't something I, with I, massive I, popular support. I would disagree so, completely. The, the, the German population by 1943, due to soldiers home on leave, the widespread involvement of the Wehrmacht and Holocaust activities, it was well known to the German population. By 43. By, yeah. by 43, not, not, not yeah. earlier, but, yeah. but it was Can just- Can I say something? It's, uh, German historians have demonstrated that. Somebody had a question. Uh, Debbie. Um, Debbie, go ahead. Uh, I don't have a question. I think the reason that uh, Jews wanted to go to Germany before Hitler came the power was the Jews in Germany were very assimilated. And um, even though there was a lot of anti-Semitism, the Jews that were there, uh, according to people that I've spoken to, um, they felt like this could something terrible like this could never happen because the German people were so enlightened, which goes along with the thing that Hitler tried to, to shield the German population as much as he could from the horrors of war and tried to pamper them by giving them the spoils of war. So I think it's right that they didn't make good Nazis, but they were against Jews and they turned a blind eye to a lot of things, but they didn't actively participate in, in it either because um, you know they were more sophisticated than doing these things like Kristallnacht, and then of course, as things got worse and worse. So I think that's why uh, maybe uh, James's family wanted to go to, um, get out of Poland to go to Germany because of that mindset that was amongst the Jews in Germany. And well, it so was, 
um, of course, it didn't do them any good because it eventually, even the ones that fought in the war, World War I, you know, eventually were persecuted also. But I think that's what the Jews around that area believed. And don't forget the thing that I mentioned before from Mein Kampf, that Hitler understood how important it was to have a fanatic, committed, elite group. Yes. And the, the SS, uh, the, the, well, the SS, which was originally from the SA, I mean, you can say that the, the average German citizen didn't support them, but the average German citizen had made themselves irrelevant from the point of view of the political struggles that were going on at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that doesn't but become that, true of, the, of the, the moderate people in the United States right now. <laughs> well, I, I agree. I agree. Hitler's intent was to mount a revolution establish a dictatorship uh, buttressed by armed force. That was his intent. But the great, what makes this fascinating is that he won legally. Hindenburg appointed him according to the Weimar Constitution. Uh, it's really, and, and what's odd is that the society tolerated his changing it in, in a completely different direction afterwards. So. The, 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 the society wanted some order. They saw Hitler and his people as a force that would take on the socialists, take on the communists, take on the trade unions that they blamed for the chaos in society. So ironically, they saw Hitler as being someone that would restore stability because they blamed all of the problems on, on the communists and the, the other forces on the left. But the political violence was mostly in the first time. Uh, the revolutions and the in Munich and Berlin and so forth. Um, by the end of the 20s, it was the Great Depression, collapse of the German economy, uh, GDP shrinking so much, people going hungry, that brought the Nazis to power. It, it was not political unrest. It was more economic unrest. Uh, I, I don't think the communists played a, a large role in that. Jack has a question. That's what I think. I don't think that... Uh, sorry, Jack had a question and you know, we'll continue to that. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Gage. Uh, even in Germany, there was a certain background radiation in a way of anti-Semitism. I had a very dear friend who came over in the late 30s when he was a teenager. He had relatives Jewish who were um, enthralled with Hitler because he was going to solve the problems, a new approach. What had been done before wasn't working. There was violence. All right, it was all the communist fault. And so they thought, they just back the wrong horse. Well, I, I didn't focus on that, that other angle of Hitler, why he was so, it wasn't, he, he was modernistic. He was perceived as the man of the future. As I said, he was the first politician to ever camp, campaign extensively by air, as far as I know. He, uh, mm. he admired many aspects of American life. He perceived America as the trendsetter for the future. Uh, so he, he loved the dynamism. He didn't love the capitalism so much, but he saw the relative absence of social class in the U.S. as a great positive. Uh, the, these were all very attractive notions. Mussolini had a lot of the same appeal. People didn't see what was behind that, that facade, if I can call it, but Hitler was, he appealed to a great many people, as did Mussolini. Uh, it, everybody shut up about this when, when war came, but a great many very respectable people in the U.S. were great Hitler admirers. Uh, Henry Ford being the uh, yeah. most famous example. But I discovered in, in reading for this, I discovered Hitler solicited Ford. Uh, he asked for some money to fund the Nazis and Ford refused. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, James had a question. Go ahead. Yeah, just a, a quick comment that um, you, you may be aware that there were, about 20 years ago, there were two books published simultaneously, almost simultaneously with the very divergent views of why there was anti-Semitism. One was um, Ordinary Men, which was by um, Christopher Browning. Yes. Who, and then the other one was uh, Hitler's Willing, Willing Executioners, which was... Um, that was a famous book at the time. Was, yeah. yeah. And they had took very different views on how, uh, whether it was Goldhagen viewed it, that was something in German history 
that and and that the anti-Semitism had uh, it had become it was uh, it it was endemic. Uh, the other book, uh, Christopher Browning's, took the view that uh, it could have happened anywhere. And in fact, he, the, the author said, if you'd asked uh, people in, uh, if you told people in 1900 that a third of Jew Jewry would be uh, 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 will die in, in a conflagration. Um, he said that people would have replied, yes, these French, they'll do anything. So uh, it, it wasn't, they didn't view it as a specifically German thing. Yes, the biggest question is interesting, is why did, there was almost no signatures left by Hitler anywhere in him being involved in any concentration camps or any kind of deportation. He was so careful, so calculated, and it was unbelievable. So. He was a, uh, obviously an anti-Semite stuff. But well, he did, uh, uh, he did make public threats. He gave that famous speech at, at the Sportpalast in Berlin that if, in 39, I believe, where he said if the Jews bring about you know, a second war, it, it will mean the end of Jew Jewry in, in Europe. I mean, he did threaten their destruction in 1939 in public. I've seen the, the film. Most of you have too, I, I imagine. It, it's just Nobody, hard to say. Anti-Semitism was weaker in Germany than in many other countries. Why did it happen there? Well, I put the emphasis on the economic horror, the horror show it was. I mean, imagine suffering, going through World War I, uh, you're 20 years old, there's nothing waiting for you if you're in the army when you get back. The economy is a mess. Three years later, you're still suffering, but you get hyperinflation. So your parents' life savings are wiped out completely. The middle class is wiped out. Six years after that, you get the Wall Street crash and the Great Depression. I, I think the level of rage in German society was, was a major factor. When people suffer, they, they don't suffer quietly. They hit out. And I think that was major, uh, a major factor in what happened. I can't think of a country in Europe uh, well, I, I take that back. I could see it happening happening in other places. So Germans are, uh, to, conducting a program is one thing, a bunch of peasants can do that. To conduct the Holocaust, you have to be in an advanced country. You have to make the trains run on time. When you think about it, it took a great, I mean, first they started shooting Jews in the East. They realized that was just inefficient, couldn't kill them fast enough. So, so they invented this whole industrialized system, which was, probably did have a lot to do with uh, uh, German culture. It's, 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 but it was it's being legal. an advanced country. Who, who was just talking? Go ahead. Jack, I'm sorry, who is that just talking? Legally. Jack, go ahead. So it was done legally? What was um, done legally? All of the attorneys, uh -huh. the, ju the judges uh -huh. that were Nazis that made this legal. Well, the the the, the, the the law, the final solution was uh, Heinrich was, Eichmann. Uh, that was uh, that was not legal. It was a completely secretive meeting, if you think of it. Um, when no, they did. The well, the, Nuremberg, the discri discri discrimination laws were passed. The Nuremberg laws were passed in the 30s. That's right. When it came to the actual industrialized killing, which happened in yeah. World War II only in the East, let's not forget that the uh, Auschwitz was a death camp. Uh, it was in Poland, uh, Dachau was in Germany, it was a concentration camp. They kept prisoners, they tortured them, but you did have a, some chance of survival. Um, Let me make a comment about Dachau, because Dachau is really interesting. There was a character named Theodor Eicke. Theodor Eicke was, uh, became a leader of the Fry Corps uh, in the early 20s, ultimately joined the, the Nazi party, joined the SS, he was the founder of Dachau. Hmm. And not only was he the founder of Dachau, but he was the founder of the entire ethos of the German concentration camps. In other words, all the people who became commandants of, of concentration camps were trained by ICA. ICA's policy was to basically train everybody in the camp, all the guards, to treat all the prisoners as viciously as possible at all times as a psychological mechanism. And um, it's, it's kind of, you know, an, an interesting 
trajectory to see him coming right out of the Fry Corps and becoming, mm -hmm. uh, ultimately he was promoted and became the head of the Waffen-SS Totenkopf Division mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Eastern Front and finally died when his Piper Stork reconnaissance plane landed mm -hmm. behind Russian lines. That didn't work out very well for him. The, the comment about the 20, about 1929, John, yeah. this was precisely the period where the, the Communist Party was referring to the Social Democrats as social fascists yeah. and was seeing them as their main opposition. So instead of organizing to, to deal with the working class response to the Depression, which was just such a tremendous opportunity for working class organizers that they totally left it and it became a vacuum. But that conflict within the workers' movement, if you will, yeah. left the door open for Hitler to waltz in. And they so, realized yeah, that, well, they well, that was do this that with, been... uh, with force. Right. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, Stalin facilitated Hitler's rise. That's definitely true. It, it goes back to socialist split over World War I. Um, those who supported the war uh, stayed in the Socialist Party. And the, the, the ones who left founded the Communist Party of Germany. And that was an original split within the left. They, they just weren't terribly well organized. And Stalin did them no favors. I assume that Stalin did it unknowingly. Um, uh, James yeah, the, the funny thing is, the, uh, I, I've observed oh. the left for years, and they hate people slightly to their right much more than they hate the far right. It's, if you live through the 60s, the radicals all hated the lib liberals much more than they hated Republicans. It was quite amazing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's very true. But yeah. how many how many parties? But we also there? hated the Rep we also hated the Republicans. Guys, they, qu question to you: before... sort of the enemy, the near enemy, the you know the liberals who were right next to you. So I, I went right. to Columbia, so I, I know about these things. <laughs> Quick question to you guys. Quick question: How many parties was there in the 1920s that could give a run for its money to Hitler? Um, and I'm talking about communists, who were the parties, and therefore well, could they're, 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 yeah, there were several German, I'm not terribly familiar with them, there were several writers' parties, particularly in Bavaria. I, any of them was capable. Uh, Hitler, Hitler had the talent. Um, it's odd. He, he was, as I said, extremely, a, extremely charismatic speaker. People really paid attention to him in, in, in his histrionic style. Now, the fact, when it came to leadership, he knew how to pick talent. Uh, I mean, they're all denigrated and, and you know, regarded as monsters to that today, which they are, but they made a very effective political team, Goering, even Rudolf Hess, Goering, Goebbels. And the amazing thing about the Hitler regime, it was stable at the top. You know, Stalin, it looked, you see pictures of Stalin with all his old cronies, you know, the old Bolsheviks in the 20s. He proceeded to ex execute every single one by the end of the 30s. Hitler, the leadership was they're all the way, from uh, beginning to the rid, end. The, got, mm, there were some exceptions. Got rid of Rome, who was, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, Rome was a direct major threat, player. Head of the armed force who, and, you know, well, was, I want to pose a question for that. And maybe, Paul, you can answer this. Uh, was Rome was about to uh, betray Hitler and therefore go on his own? Or was it just set up by, um, I guess, the uh, people setting him up so the like Hitler had eliminated, and there was a long night. I think it was. I think it was a demand from the army. I think the army demanded from Hitler that he rein in the SA, and Hitler said, "Okay, I'm not only going to rein in the SA, I'm going to decapitate the SA." And it was it was after that that the army started taking an oath to out of Hitler personally, and not to the German nation. Interesting. So I think that was Hitler cementing the loyalty of the German army. And yes, there were some, some uh, you know, more populist strains in the SA than there were in the other organizations. And Hitler was happy to clean that up. So was he ashamed of the, uh, not ashamed, but he wanted to go mainstream, so to speak. Well, he needed yeah, the yes, army. He, did. he needed the army. He knew the army was the key to everything. Okay.
That make that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, Michael, you had some to uh, you had some to add. I apologize. Where's Mike? Mike. Um, whatever it was. I forgot that you said. Whatever <laughs> it was, it's passed now. So passed. Okay, fine. I will uh, make one. If I actually let me make one quick comment. We were talking ahead. earlier about um, uh, Hitler uh, believing that he had to basically develop a cadre, um, and I. I, I, John said something to the effect that he admired Lenin and, and the Bolsheviks in that regard. I just wanted to point out um, that, in fact, the idea is quite old. Um, Oliver Cromwell uh, once said, a few honest men are better than numbers. Yes. An early version, if you will. Interesting. I mean, I think it's been true throughout history that ultimately, you know, you get a, a small group of people that make a plan and get, you know, very motivated co-thinkers to carry it out. Perhaps. Um, uh, th that in and of itself is obviously not sufficient. Um, but yes, yes it right. is. You need it to is, be in the right. It is an organization in the right principle. right conjunctural yes. crisis. Uh, well, you need a program. That has oh. to, you know, that has to be attractive to some segment of the population. You have to have some yeah. basis for believing uh, that you can develop the forces to overcome your enemy, your, the forces of your enemies. I um, think for, for a revolution, for a revolutionary force to be successful, they have to be thinking in terms of what I call a conjunctural perspective. In other words, you're out there telling people to abandon the things that are working for them in their current life and go on to do something entirely different, establish a worker state or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. and they, will, they will listen to you, but they will ignore you. You're a crazy person. But at the point when everything starts falling apart, like the Great Depression, that's the point when people will say, well, that guy out there, well, he's been saying the same thing consistently for the last four years and I thought he was crazy. Well, maybe he's not so crazy because the stuff that they were counting on to carry them through and, and represented normality in life are now things that are, are, are no longer things that they can use. They are destroyed, they're shattered, and they're, 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 they're uh, vulnerable to, to, to the program in itself is not enough. It has to be married to a conjunctural crisis in which people are yeah. ready to change their minds. That's, that's that's a phenomenon known as the mass strike and it happens throughout the population it's a really interesting phenomenon hmm. yes i i fully agree with you i would i would say any you can call it conjunctural but it's it's a more it's it's an even more generalized social crisis yeah um you know whether it's um uh england in 1640 or russia in 1917 I have a particular or, question. Or, or okay. Germany, or Germany in 1930 or 33, where it goes the other way. Right, that's true. I have a particular question. Um, in 1933, when Papen was working so hard in Hitler's behalf, Hitler almost uh, wanted to put a you know kabush to everything and wanted to move back to Bavaria, and um, I believe Himmler stopped him and said, "You have to come back," and you know. So at the time, I think if he pop and didn't really work hard for him to um, otherwise get into the government, you know, under Hindenburg, um, would you think that that would have been the end of Hitler? Uh, was there points where um, in 1930s, 1920s, where it could have been just the end for him, where he just basically said, I'm done with this, I'm washing my hands off this, I no longer believe in, and I'm going back to Bavaria, I'm going back to Munich. Um, Stuff, stuff. That is a lot of people were working well, with him. Nazis Go always ahead. had bad financial. I'm sorry. The Nazis always had bad financial problems. For example, uh, all the party members had to pay on a regular basis. So they, they, things looked really black for Hitler on many occasions, uh, particularly right before he took power in December. He was almost on the verge of despairing in December of 32 because Hindenburg was being totally obstinate. Um, right. But he didn't he sell class. his book, his rights for to another rights. I mean, he didn't he sell Oh, I'm his... talking about the party. He, he became a 
after he became William chancellor, Everett. it was pretty much mandatory to buy his book. He became very wealthy indeed. But uh, yes, he was, he was very wealthy, right? And uh, but uh, not not in the twenties. Uh, that's not, not in the twenties. Right, right. Not not. I I don't know what the sales figures on Mein Kampf were. It came out in twenty four. I think it was like a, a five, 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 five million or something like that. I, mean, uh, I think it's it, safe to say that Hitler wasn't in it for the money. No. <laughs> Obviously. That's, that's always, uh, I will say in the aftermath, Hitler did amazingly well as chancellor in the 30s. Um, people didn't see that bad, bad things were going to happen, but he was something of a Keynesian. He pumped the economy, you know, started rearming like crazy. Well, the, um, and the, the he became the most, probably the most popular politician in the world. John, are you familiar the, with Kjellmar Schacht? Yes, the, the finance minister. So I think that, that a lot that, of that these was key policies, to path and strategy. I think a lot of these, this, this, yeah, this may have, successful financial policy came from Schacht. Well, Hitler is recorded as, as saying that he believed in the multiplier factor and priming the pump. I don't know what the German equivalents are, but they're very Keynesian notions. So he was familiar with them. Who did the actual work? I mean, Hitler assented to the policy. So what yes, the leader Hitler actually does is the policy, but you needed an actual, you know, someone who was capable of actually doing yeah. it. And it wasn't something that had been done before. I think it was Hjalmar yeah. Schacht who was called the wizard Correct. and got off scot-free at Nuremberg. I'd just like to ask yeah, one well, question. Jane, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jane. Uh, I apologize, guys. Go ahead. Yeah, I suppose Hitler had refrained from invading anything. Suppose, did he have to go to war? Would anybody have cared what was going on in Germany? Would there have been a Holocaust? I just wonder if anybody has any speculations on that. Yeah, Hitler could have died a natural death. Um, it, it's, he, it's his personality, which again is mystery. He was a driven man. He, he really was a man of destiny. I mean, his ego is, is, was unmatched. Um, well, what about Lebensraum, John? Just, he, which one? Me? Yeah, he did. He thought Lebensraum, as part of his policy, he thought Lebensraum was essential, the most essential factor along with racial purification to ensuring a great Germany. He was a patriot in a sense. I mean, a crazy patriot, but he wanted the best for Germany and that implied uh, aggression. And I would say he was, in, as I think I've said before at another meeting, he was insanely aggressive. When you think about the risks he took, he was just nuts. Um, but, you know, in the thirties at the beginning, everything, you know, the- um, I mean, I think there, I've, I've read um, some analyses where they kind of basically conclude that had Hitler not been a crazy anti-Semite, he might have succeeded. Well, can I make one, one other point that if you were looking at alternative histories, I, I think the, the person who, it, it, I'm, a, I'm a finance guy, so the person in, in German history who was, um, was, who if he had lived longer, would have changed a lot, was uh, Gustav um, Dresemann. Settleman. So what is it? Dresemann. Yeah, he was a very capable person. Uh, yeah, but he, none of those... Uh... Oh, go on. He, he was chancellor and uh, at the end, but before him, that before, he was the finance minister. And he uh, is credited with solving Fleshman, is you know, yeah name is uh, 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 claiming the hyperinflation by uh, linking indirectly the, the a new currency, the Renten mark, to um, the equities market, which is really clever. And the same method is used in other mm -hmm. countries. You, you said that at the last meeting, and I was really fascinated by it. And I, I confess that I just don't understand how it worked. No, the details, I don't understand exactly how it worked, frankly. But that is credited with, with taming that. And it's, it's um, and, and, and he also had this um, romance with Ariste Beyond, who was the French finance, foreign, foreign minister, perhaps. And they talked about the common market.
that they might one day form. Interesting. Um, I, uh, it's interesting in the beginning, you guys brought up the point about Hitler being a practical man. I don't know if this is true, but they said that, uh, apparently, um, in Germany, they have developed a nuclear weapon, um, in, you know, before 1945 and, you know, using the heavy water from Norway, um, as, you know, as versus the, uh, you know, the uranium and stuff like that. And, um, and what's interesting is they approached Hitler the scientists approached Hitler and said, we could end this war using the, the, the rockets that they used to bomb uh, London. What is it? Uh, something V2. with a, yeah, V2. We can use that V1. and uh, V1, V2, yeah. V2. And so we can use that and we can, you know, obviously generate the warhead um, using the heavy water. And uh, he said, no, I don't want, I need to do, to do the fact that I think of Slavic people so low, I wanted to conquer them on land and therefore create the, the space for German people to live. Having them bomb them with nuclear weapons would destroy a lot of the land and therefore it's not good for me. Hmm. I don't I believe wanna... that for a that second. I hadn't heard. <laughs> there, there I was a for one second. There, there was a nuclear program. Uh, Werner Heisenberg uh, right. was the German physicist in charge. It, it's been thought that Heisenberg may have been dragging his feet to some extent, sort of a closet Hitler opponent. Uh, I haven't read about it in years, so this this may be half yeah. remembered. But I see they never got their eyes. The physicists never got their, the German physicists never got their arms wrapped around the concept of a nuclear bomb because when, when the Americans did it, it was kind of an engineering project. It was you know, they had to figure out how to trigger the nuclear reaction yeah. with yeah. a minor explosion. But there was two. The Germans two, just two, never two. got 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 down to the engineering level. And, so and Zach, the heavy water was not a fuel. It was not a hydrogen bomb using deuterium. The heavy water was used to refine uranium. Right. There was nobody right. talking about a fusion bomb at that time. Heavy water was used as a processing mm. uh, medium, but not as itself a fuel for a nuclear reaction. Right. No, but the, 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 the three people that, or two people that used the Manhattan Project were educated in Germany, um, the Jews, uh, I forget the name. Correct. One of, I mean, yeah. There's the yeah. other speculation of if Hitler hadn't been anti-Semitic, all the Jewish scientists would have stayed in Germany and he would have had the bomb first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but the anti-Semitism was the heart and soul of what he, he had no political right. existence without being anti-Semitic. I mean, that, that was... What, I mean, there were, well, there were fascist regimes in other countries that were not anti-Semitic. Yeah. yeah, like Mussolini, Mussolini, right? He was not anti-Semitic, right? No, he not, had just, no... not just in Italy. They were all throughout Europe. There were fascist parties that yeah. were, had diff varying degrees of success, and they didn't feature that kind of self-defeating uh, anti-Semitism. So let's talk about it. Like Croatian, for example, the cross, what is it? Uh, the Iron well, Cross. Well, they were anti-Semitic. Yes, yeah, they were, were, right? I mean, if, if you think of it. They manned uh, the concentration camps in correct. Some, some degree. The Ukrainian, they were definitely, you know, uh, in a lot of respects, anti-Semitic, even prior to, and, you know, uh, Germans entering there, obviously. Um, I mean, there's, there's the Spanish there were, weren't particularly anti Well, that's not true. Well, Fra Franco Before survived the war. But I don't understand that. How is Franco surviving the war? He was smart enough to stay out of it. I mean, he... he <laughs> I mean, he died in his bed in 1975 because he was smart enough to see that joining up with the Germans was a bad idea. And it was a, it was a betrayal of Hitler because the- uh, And nobody um, in the West would- Germans have had, had supplied him in, in 1936 in the Civil War, so- None of the Western uh, governments was, would have he, preferred a socialist uh, Spain to Franco. Franco was much better as far as they were concerned then, you know, if, if Spain yeah. went like Russia, right, right, or the right. first, the next really huge domino. Yeah, but there was a lot of volunteers from Spain that fought for Nazis. They called Red Army or Red, Red, uh, something with Red. Yeah. I, I think it was the, the, the it was Blue Division or something. Yeah, and they, and it, was, they it was the Charlemagne Division from France. It was all over. Right. But, right. but the, the, you know, kind of, the, the point is that there was more of a division between between Reds and, and Nazis or fascists uh, than there were in terms of, 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 national, dis of national differences in many cases. Both of them were, were international movements. Yeah. 
That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I think Hitler is a, Hitler's career is a, is a demonstration of the fact that individual personalities do have great impacts on history sometimes. It's not just conflicts between anonymous classes of people. I think it's his personal obsessions seem to, you know, joined hands with German cultural attitudes and trends and produced this this great disaster. Uh, but uh, without him, Germany would not have gone to, gone down the route it did. I don't, don't believe he was a bit too talented. Um, right. So to set up the, in two weeks, we're going to do something like this again, but we're going to do Battle of Kursk. Uh, I don't know if you, you know, a lot of people familiar here. Battle of Kursk was, you know, one of the monumental battles of the World War II. Uh, we did the Battle of Moscow, Kursk. We're going to do Kursk, and another two weeks we're going to do Battle of Stalingrad. Um, and to set it up, do you think that when Hitler saw and Russia or Soviet Union helped Fran you know, the opposing party of Franco in the Spanish War, when he saw how weak they were in the Finnish War, do you think that would let Hitler then invade Russia because of the fact that he saw how weak Russia was as far as the, um, the army is concerned? Yeah. Well, that's certainly the story. You know, he said just all you had to do is give it one good kick. Well, I don't think I mentioned it, but Hitler had a very low opinion of the Bolshevik uh, government from day one. Um, he didn't think, he didn't worry about them. He didn't think they were capable of being effective mil militarily. And he held that view all the way up until he found out differently in, in, uh, on the Eastern Front. But it was a kind of amazing thing about his thinking is how constant and predictable it is. Um, and he, when he worried about Bolshevism, it would, it was, would be affecting the German working class. That's what he worried about. Uh, proselytization, you know, with creating a revolutionary movement, but he did yeah. not worry about the, the, the Soviet state. At all, if you uh, see which what was a great, great era. Did from the point of view of repression, the first people that that Hitler imprisoned were the communists and the trade union leaders. He got rid of them first before he looked at anybody else. And the, you know the reason that they call it totalitarianism is because it basically uh, uh, reached into every form of of life. There was nothing yeah. in which the the Nazis didn't reach their fingers in. I mean, if you read um, de Tocqueville's Democracy in America, de Tocqueville says that the key to democracy in America is this huge number of independent organizations of a vast number of types, you know, uh, uh, chambers of commerce and religious and whatever it is, but they're all independent democratic opera uh, organizations. And that's exactly what Hitler went to stomp out. And that's exactly what Stalin went to stomp out. Oh, yeah, and that's uh, kind of what they have in common. I, I would submit that, that the Soviets got much further down that road than Hitler ever did. Um, they, they tried to Nazify the society completely. They didn't have, but they only had 12 years. Uh, they, all, they did pretty well with the youth. They did extremely well, but the churches were independent. There was a famous Bishop Gallen in, in, in Munster. He, was a, he gave a sermon against Hitler's um, elimination of the, of the disabled uh, in 1941 from the pulpit. And he was basically under house arrest for the rest of the war, but he survived. It was, That's un, unimaginable under Stalin. He just destroyed the churches. Right. Well, so, one, I'd like to make one comment on that. Go ahead, Mike. The key distinction, ahead, Mike. the key distinction between Stalin's Russia and uh, Hitler's Germany is that in Germany, the Nazi Party dictated to the owners of capital, the bourgeoisie what they should produce, how they should produce it, and the conditions that they would produce it under. They completely commandeered it for, particularly, of course, for the war effort. That wasn't true in Russia. In Russia- you mean in Germany. I'm sorry? You say that wasn't- you True said... in Russia. In Russia, the bourgeoisie was expropriated. The state ran, was yeah. take, took over, uh, production and the economy totally and ran it itself. That's why all of the German corporations like Bayer,
continued to exist throughout and after the war, continue to make their profits under the Nazis. Oh, I, That's I agree. the key difference if, between them. If you can rank them, Hitler was less totalitarian than Stalin. Well, that, yeah, that um, aspect you know, of what the Soviet Union did still existed in Germany. That was basically Marxism 101. That was the real yeah. consistent action of saying that that you know investment decisions on society will be made centrally for the good of the working class is the you know the the uh, the, the 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 slogan way of, of expressing what that yeah. is. But that was to the extent there was any genuine Marxism there, that's what you do. You make yes, except the, it, with one caveat that it wasn't simply being done for the good of the working class. Uh -huh. uh, initially, it was done through and with the Soviets, including endless factories, which were workers' democratic organizations, which, of course, no longer existed under Stalin, by Stalin's time. Right. Well, but it's interesting. Hitler, Hitler's point was, why do I need to expropriate the, or nationalize all the factories when I can nationalize people's souls and it's their force all belong to me anyway? So there was there was a type of, of organization associated with fascism called corporate corporativism. So in other words, the, the Nazis were, were big on organizing basically councils of workers and management within plants. So rather than organizing on a class basis, they organized on a basis that crossed class which basically ended up being a form of social control and co-optation. But Hitler believed, did not believe in class conflict in, in the, the Marxist sense. He, yeah. The big theme of all the propaganda in the 20s is reconciliation between the classes, between the, the, the brain and the hands, as they put it, whereas the Soviets, they were going to supplant one class by another, just eliminate one class. I mean, it was a when, when Hitler profound that, difference. When Hitler said because that, it's associated with him totally destroying the, the, all of the, of the institutions, independent labor institutions in which workers could actually defend their, their standard of living. So he'd go in and say, yes, let's have peace and let's have industrial yeah. community and so propaganda, forth. Right? But basically it, it was, meant that, that, you know, you do what the boss tells you. Yeah, and but it was, much, much, much as like Ralph pointed out, it was the same boss as in, in the pre-Hitler days. I mean, it was still the same executive class in all these industries. It, it wasn't being yeah. run by commissar. Interesting. Now, they had to conform, and that's a very interesting question. Uh, you know, it's called Gleichschaltung. You know, all, all these organizations had to conform to the Nazi aims, but they weren't micromanaged. But certainly all the social organizations were taken over. Yeah. Interesting. Anybody else have any other questions or, uh, before yeah. we close out? Uh, Jane, uh, Maggie, James, um, uh, Stephanie, Michael, Ralph, Judith, I just, Debbie. I just want to say, sorry. I was yeah. just going to say I, I thought this was an extremely enlightening presentation. Yeah, so I, I, it was so incredible. Thanks very much for doing it. Yes. John, yeah, you're going you're gonna to continue in two weeks on Battle of Kursk. Uh, no, you let me think gonna... about it. Okay, fine. Is there, is there a reason why you decided to do Kursk before Stalingrad? Oh, I'm sorry. Battle of Stalingrad. <laughs> I apologize. Battle of Stalingrad before Battle of Kursk. I, I didn't put it on the schedule yeah, yet. I want to you really need to know about Stalingrad Kursk. to understand Kursk. So I'm looking for volunteers for this type of information. If, if uh, John, you know, still in decision mode, let me know, John. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. I know this. This took this took a lot, and I gave you a really short yeah. notice. I apologize. Really, but this was incredible. Discussion. I've got to go, everybody. So I'm going to say good night. Thank you. Yeah, good night. Hey, okay. Good night. Good night. Thanks, so I guess, very, thanks very much. I guess uh, I'm looking for somebody who present uh, <laughs> Stalingrad, or you know, we'll see. Maybe you know, we'll put some maps on, uh, and we'll just talk it out. I, this was incredible, John. I mean, I, oh, I okay. liked. Uh, first of all, you gave such a good perspective of this, uh, and it was a, a, a well-read and well-enlightened perspective, and we all kind of now see things in much more detail 
uh, I was I was channeling that Brandon Brandon Sims guy. Who, who, I, everybody thinks there's nothing new to say about Hitler, but he came up with something new, which you know I was not aware of. So oh, well. I'm going to drop out. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, Michael. No problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, so this this was uh, this was very good. Like I said, uh, make sure that you um, you know come in on this Saturday. We have uh, Thermopylae and the famous uh, Battle of Three Hundred, uh, Greek versus Persian. So it, it's it, we do a switch <laughs> to ancient uh, Greece, um, and then uh, on Sunday, you know, if you guys wish, we have a dinner uh, and and uh, discussion Georgian restaurant we're going to talk about uh countries that were part of georgia in ancient time which is the caucus albania colchis mm. and iberia and uh we're going to eat some georgian food and we're going to post it <laughs> so uh if you guys want join us it's 12 o'clock in georgian restaurant called marani it's really good food it's um really uh i mean i already tasted it so that i know it's good food, so. where is it it's in Rigo Park, Queens. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, Rigo Park, Queens. Uh, and I know some of you guys are not in New York, but we're going to be there. And, and thank you so much, John, again. And uh, I'll see you Saturday and hopefully see you Sunday. And then the following week, we'll do World War uh, II Pacific uh, Theater, which Aaron is going to present that. And then from there on, we'll figure it out. We have a lot of good presentations, kind of Phoenicians. You know, we have a presentation on Kosovo battle, which is, a, you know, um, when uh, a Serbian uh, soldier kills Murad uh, III, who was a sultan. It, was, it would be an interesting. It would be presented by Vlad, who is a, actually uh, a, a Serb from Kosovo. So he's, he's going to talk about it. So it's going to be an interesting aspect of it. All right, guys. And um, I'll talk to you uh, this week, next week, whenever you guys join. Thank you and have a nice evening. Thank you so much, John. Well, thank thank you. you so much, John. Yeah, yeah. Have a good rest of the evening. You too.